There's a war going on right now and there's a good chance you've probably never heard of it. It's something that I feel like the world is starting to forget about. It is incredibly important for the world to give a damn. Accusations of genocide, apartheid conditions, entire towns burnt to the ground, torture, and more than a million people forced from their homes. Crimes that we're seeing now are on a scale that I don't think we've seen since probably the Khmer Rouge. Conditions have indeed gone from bad to worse, to horrific. All of this is going on in Myanmar, and it's Myanmar's military that's being accused of perpetrating these crimes against its own people. We should be as concerned about what is happening in Myanmar as we are about what is happening in Ukraine. The people have no understanding of what's going, of the hell, living hell, that life in Myanmar is right now. In early 2021, the military launched a coup and seized power after claiming that the recent elections in the country had been rigged, something that independent election observers and experts say simply isn't true. There's no substantial evidence for what they are claiming. A state of emergency was announced and military general Min Aung Hlaing took control of the country. Politicians and critics of the military were locked up, including the nation's leader and the rightful winner of the election, Aung San Suu Kyi. In the years since, the situation has escalated into a civil war, and the military behind all of this has repeatedly been accused by human rights groups and United Nations experts of committing crimes against humanity and even genocide. The question you might be wondering right now is, how could all of this happen? And is the rest of the world doing anything about it? Before we can answer all of these questions, it's important to understand that for the people of Myanmar, this isn't new. We're seeing a continuation of what the military has been doing for years, if not decades. The military in Myanmar has a long history of using violence to seize and maintain power. When Myanmar, or as it was known back then, Burma, finally gained its independence after more than a century of British rule, it didn't take long for the military to step in and take control. The military got fed up with civilian government and its inability to control the country and took power in 1958 and again in 1962. And then from then on, 1962, right up till 2010, you had a few different uh, generations of military government. The junta rebranded itself, renamed itself, but essentially the military held power. The military basically controlled all aspects of daily life and violently dealt with anything that it perceived as a threat. One of the most infamous examples of this came in 1988, when an uprising started by students grew into a movement of hundreds of thousands of people protesting for democracy. The military responded with brutality. They shot live ammunition into protesters in the street. Troops have been shooting people all day. Twice today, troops came to the hospital demanding that they be given the bodies of the dead and also the wounded. When the nurses and the doctors refused, the troops opened fire, killing at least four doctors and eight nurses. Everyone knew about Tiananmen Square, but not about what happened in Myanmar. The thousands, if not tens of thousands, died. Student activists in their 20s were sentenced to 50 years plus 50 years for participating in a peaceful protest. Aung San Suu Kyi, who emerged as a leading voice of the movement, was placed under house arrest where she remained for 15 years. During that time, she continued to push for change with her political party, the NLD, and was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. A key part of the bigger picture here is that the military didn't just target protesters or political rivals, but also entire ethnic minority groups, to the point of being accused of genocide. Myanmar is made up of a number of different ethnic groups, the largest being the Bama, who traditionally have dominated the military and positions of power. When the country first gained independence, an agreement was signed that promised a number of these groups a level of autonomy and self-governance, and even a potential pathway to independence. But that's also partly why the military justified the coup in 1962, it was a way to keep the country together and make sure that these ethnic communities didn't break off from the rest of the country. When the military seized power, Burmanized policies were introduced, suppressing the language, culture and religions of minorities. 
I've spoken with uh, grandfathers who told me that even to wear like a Karen shirt, you would be seen as a terrorist, basically, or an enemy of the state. This oppression led to rising ethnic tensions, which the military then responded to by introducing even more brutal and extreme tactics. And those particular campaigns were extremely brutal um, over the 1970s and 80s, where they introduced what was referred to as the four cuts policy. Uh, the idea is to deprive the enemy of any support from the civilian population, which entails massive campaigns to burn, destroy, and target uh, any villages that are seen as supporting ethnic armed groups. And because these lines are so blurred, the military has indiscriminately targeted civilians across the country. Eventually, by the late 2000s, international and economic pressure led to the military announcing that it would be shifting to a more democratic system of government. However, the military only agreed to share power in this new system because the new constitution, which the military basically wrote, guaranteed that the military would keep control over key areas of everyday life and defence, and would always hold a quarter of the seats in parliament no matter what. This basically ensured that the military would have veto power over most of what was going on, including any potential changes to the constitution. So, even in 2015, when Myanmar held its first genuinely open election since the 60s, and the NLD won in a massive landslide against the pro-military party, the USDP, it still wasn't enough to break the military's hold on power. To get an idea of just how little the military's power had been diminished, one of its bloodiest campaigns against an ethnic minority group came in 2017 while the NLD was in power. The Rohingya people are seen uh, ostensibly as Bengalis from Bangladesh. They are not seen as citizens of Myanmar. They haven't had access to citizenship rights. Entire villages were burnt to the ground, tens of thousands were tortured or killed, and more than a million were forced to flee from their homes. that's why it's referred to as a, ge a genocide because you can see the systematic persecution of them and the rhetoric that they were using was conversations around you know eliminating them from from Myanmar. While most experts agree that the NLD didn't really have the political power to stop the military, Aung San Suu Kyi actually went and defended the military on the world stage. The NLD has in the past been accused of not prioritising the welfare and rights of certain minority ethnic groups. Aung San Suu Kyi comes from the Burma majority and, you know, ethnic communities really feel this strong sense that she was unable to see or empathise with their experiences as ethnic minority communities. Experts say this likely has a bit to do with the decades of military propaganda, which has worked to divide the country and create tensions between the many ethnic groups in Myanmar. We've had since the 60s the military manipulating every facet of our lives, from education to recognition of ethnic groups, who is a citizen and who isn't. It's been something that has been taught through the military education for decades. Um, and unfortunately, I do think that lots of members of the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi would pray to that. To add to this, there was also, of course, a constant fear that the military would overthrow the government if challenged. And I think that became really clear in 2017 when Aung San Suu Kyi's, one of her legal advisors, was assassinated in broad daylight. And that was a, seen as a warning to Aung San Suu Kyi. You might be wondering, if the NLD was seemingly unwilling to challenge the military in 2017, why did the military even bother overthrowing the government just a few years later? There are a couple of potential reasons. Members of the NLD had begun talking more openly about wanting to weaken the military's political and economic power. Calls for change amongst the general population had been growing, and the NLD scored an even bigger election win against the pro-military USDP. I think that the military expected the USDP to get like a higher percentage of the vote and they would have used that as a way to control parliament. After the election in early 2021, the military reportedly tried to pressure the NLD to appoint military general Min Aung Lai as president. 
the NLD reportedly refused, and a few days later, the military seized power. In the years since the coup began, a lot has changed. Most of the young people didn't take up arms immediately. They, they took to the streets to voice their peaceful protest. However, when the military started shooting unarmed protesters in the streets, peaceful protesting gave way to armed resistance and civil war. A lot of them have told me that they feel like they've been left, um, they have no other choice than to defend themselves. So, who's actually leading this resistance? At the forefront is the NUG, which is basically made up of a lot of the people that would have been democratically elected if the elections hadn't been overturned. This national unity government is basically a representative of the people of Myanmar that are fighting for democracy, and they claim to control more than 50% of the country. The NUG formed in early 2021 and began working alongside and getting help from a number of ethnic resistance organisations, many of which have decades of experience dealing with the kinds of tactics the military has used to crush opponents and minority groups in the past. Over the past few years, numerous human rights groups, experts and journalists have been working with people inside Myanmar to create a clearer picture of the crimes allegedly being committed by the military. They're bombing civilian targets in Chin State in the north. They're torching houses across Magwe. It's even arrested and tortured and killed children uh, involved in either demonstrations or family members of political leaders who have been detained. And it's done so with the goal of shocking and eyeing the people People into submission. All of this has significantly worsened the humanitarian crisis in Myanmar. 17.6 million people are expected to be in need of humanitarian aid in 2023. That is in contrast to a total of 1 million people who were in need of humanitarian aid before the coup. And the military has been repeatedly accused of blocking aid from reaching those in need setting up roadblocks, preventing aid convoys from going to areas not under their control, and they've been attacking humanitarians who are trying to do their work on the ground. And this brings us to the final section. Since the coup began in 2021, global attention has faded, and experts say the international community needs to do more. There's three things that the junta needs to sustain itself. It needs money, it needs weapons, and it needs uh, legitimacy. To give itself more legitimacy, the military has announced new elections so that it can appear to support democracy while bringing in a new government that it can control. UN member states have been urged to ignore this election and instead recognise the NUG as the rightful government of Myanmar. There have also been calls for an international arms embargo as countries like Russia and China have continued to supply the military with weapons. When it comes to money, targeted economic sanctions are being encouraged. Some countries, including recently Australia, have imposed varying levels of sanctions. But experts say their effectiveness is limited if these countries aren't working together and if a number of Myanmar's neighbours continue to do business with the military. Right now you have countries doing this, countries doing that, a whole hodgepodge of things that are being done, but they don't add up. They're not focused, they're not strategic, they're not coordinated, and that's what has to happen. After two years of fighting and a worsening humanitarian situation, human rights groups, UN experts and members of the NUG simply want to see the same level of support given to the people of Myanmar that they've seen go to others in need. When Ukraine was invaded, it took the United Nations just a matter of days to, to take extraordinary action. So the question is, why can't this happen with respect to the atrocities that are being uh, placed upon the people of Myanmar. Why not Myanmar is the question. It's possible to do. We've seen it. It's happening before our eyes. Why not Myanmar?